In this video, I'm going to show you how to write amazing metal shaders for use with Swift UI. I'm going to start out showing you what shaders are and how they work, and then we'll write some basic shaders and add more and add more and add more, explaining every line of code as we go until we're building more advanced shaders together. But you'll really see how the whole process works. Now, when you read a blog post about metal or see a video about metal, you probably think to yourself, goodness me, this is gonna hurt my brain. And I get it, I understand exactly why. Metal has a long standing reputation of being complicated. So even that we have uh, excellent tutorials like this one here, it takes a lot of reading, a lot of coding, a lot of understanding to get anywhere. In this case, producing a silhouette with a teapot was all that code. At the same time, we know that Apple's own frameworks like Reality Kit and AR Kit and Scene Kit and Sprite Kit are already hand optimized by Apple's internal teams to be lightning fast on Metal. So how could we possibly do better? Well, in iOS 17, Apple did something quite brilliant. They extended Swift UI to provide deep integration with Metal. Now this has existed in iOS 13 onward Swift UI in a simple way, using the drawing group modifier. This thing had a job of taking a whole group of complex Swift UI layouts and effects and flattening them down to a single texture being rendered by Metal for faster performance. That's been there for quite a while. But this new API goes much, much further. Imagine you take a picture like this one here, this Italian pizza, and you break this thing down to its constituent pixels which is what all images are, of course, behind the scenes. What this new API does is let us take every one of those pixels individually and pass them through metal effects we've designed. And best of all, 95% of the work is being done by SwiftUI. All that boring setup code and rendering code has been done for us, leading us to focus on the fun stuff, all the transformations, all the interesting parts, right? And so, it's a big, big difference, a lot more control. Now, it doesn't mean it's easy. It's still a bit of work required. There are still some speed bumps ahead. That language you know and love, Swift, is sadly not used much in this process. Instead, we've got to use Metal's own shading language. Now, this is a C-like language. So if you used them before, like C or C++ or similar, you'll be at home. But honestly, it's not so hard to get to grips with. We're doing small amounts here as we go. Now, if you aren't familiar with this term, shading, it's a bit of an old one. Uh, if you imagine your job is to try and take a picture like this one here, the Italian flag, and you want to transform it somehow. Let's say you want to take uh, all these green pixels and recolor them to be blue, make the French flag instead of the Italian flag. You would go through all the pixels, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, white, white, red, red, whatever. You just copy them across as you need to, one by one. That's how I, uh, these shaders work behind the scenes. But realistically, there are many other kinds of effects you can do, not just you know recoloring stuff. For example, you might be trying to stretch the pixels out somehow to blow them up to be bigger. And now what you've got is a single pixel in the source input can become three or five or 50 pixels in the output. Or perhaps you're writing a blur effect where you read 10 or 20 pixels in your source image to write a single output pixel. And so in the olden days, we'd call these things, these little functions we're writing, pixel shaders. Transform one pixel to another pixel again and again and again. But that doesn't really use much anymore. Instead, we call them fragments, a fragment shader, because one pixel can become many, or we might read many to become one. It's not just pixel one-to-one -one mapping anymore. So a fragment shader, or writing in this particular video here, is a tiny program that takes one part of its input and transforms it somehow. Now I want you to think about pixels for a second longer. Imagine you've got an iPhone 15 Pro Max in your hand. This thing has a screen resolution of 2796 by 1290. Huge, high resolution screen. And that means, just in terms of pixel count alone, rendering that screen takes 3.6 million pixels. It's extraordinary. Now, unless you have low battery mode turned on, uh, what you have 
is 120 hertz. You have pro motion display rendering the screen 120 times a second. So you take 3.6 million, multiply by 120 times a second, this thing's capable of rendering 432 million pixels a second. That's a lot. That's, in fact, an extraordinary amount. And we think about that thing going through our shader. Again and again, running 432, of our, 432 million of our function calls every single second. And that's just for one shader. Imagine a modern game where there's 10 or 20 or more shaders running at the same time. These things are going to run a heck of a lot. And that might sound bad. Thinking, well, how can you run 432 million things a second rather than, you know, never mind 10 shaders or whatever. Turns out it's perfectly okay. Again, our pixels being drawn on the screen. When we're transforming these pixels, it is what we call an embarrassingly parallel workload, which means we can split the workup of transforming these things perfectly because we can render them all in parallel as much as possible. The job of transforming one pixel doesn't somehow depend on transforming another pixel. They aren't linked together. They can be done one, then the next one, then the next one. They can do 10 or 20 or many more at the same time. And if you're wondering how many more at the same time, the answer is actually very simple. Your modern A17 Pro, which is in your iPhone 15 and similar, is actually packed with tiny, dedicated CP units called shader units that are responsible for transforming these uh, pixels one at a time many, many times over. And this thing actually has 768 of those tiny shader units running in parallel. So it's perfectly fine to transform all those pixels at the same time. It's incredibly, incredibly fast. So that's what shaders are. You might wonder why I care. Why should I care about uh, shaders? And that's actually because I've been using shaders for years. I actually released a large open source library for SpriteKit back in 2017 called ShaderKit. It's written back then in GLSL, which is the OpenGL shading language. And uh, it, I found it just so much fun to produce effects like distortions and water and lighting blah, 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 for sprite kit games. It's all on GitHub, by the way. So I've been doing things for years, and I love them because they're just so much fun to work with. That's why I care. Why should you care? I think one of the reasons is because if you're in Xcode and you press Shift-Command-H to Xcode, you get the human interface guidelines from Apple, the HIG, the, the HIG we normally call it. And this is because we're iOS developers or, or macOS or Vision OS developers. We're Apple platform developers. We care about design. We care about making things look and feel great. We love surprise and delight. And metal shaders are a tiny piece of work you can do to add some sparkle, some delight to your apps. In comparison, talk about keyboard shortcuts, if you're a Windows user and you press Control alt shift windows l from literally anywhere in Windows, it launches LinkedIn because we're a very different kind of developers on the Apple platforms compared to Windows. And that's okay, you know, I'll be boring if we're all the same, let's face it. Anyway, that's the intro done. From here on, I'll be building metal shaders with you so you can see exactly what they can do. And again, we're going to start small and work our way forwards incrementally. And by the end, you'll see some more advanced shaders. But hopefully, you'll see how we got there so you've understood all the steps along the way. And be warned, there is going to be mathematics involved. And then I'll do my best to explain as best I can. But this is like an hour-long video being done live in one take. I'm going to make mistakes almost certainly. I'm doing my best, okay? I'm sure the... <clears throat> YouTube hive mind will take great pleasure in correcting me in the comments because they always do. Um, when I say it's going to make your head hurt, it, it will. There's lots of math involved. It's not a joke. I do lots of code-based presentations, lots of code-based videos. Uh, this is by far the most code-heavy, so brace yourselves. We're going to start simple. We're going to start with simple shaders, the simplest possible shader we can write. This thing is called a pass-through shader. What it does is it reads the color of a pixel and it writes that same color out again, changing nothing. Now the SwiftUI code we'll be using, the setup sort of harness we'll have is this thing here. An SS symbol of figure.walk.circle, a nice and large font with a blue foreground color. And here's how it'll look. That's the thing we're gonna try and transform with metal. Now in Xcode, when you're making your metal file, 
Do not choose Swift file. This is not Swift code anymore. Instead, you want to make all your shaders inside a dedicated metal file. You can have more than one if you want to. Put multiple in one file. It doesn't really matter. It's down to you. But make sure you choose metal file. Otherwise, this whole rest of the video is not going to work very well for you. Once you do that, you'll get this template code here. You can see already, like, hash include. This looks C-like. It's a C-like language right here. But there are two very precise rules we must follow when writing our shaders for SwiftUI here. First, SwiftUI looks for exact, precise function signatures. The exact return value, the exact list of parameters being accepted, the exact types of those parameters must be correct. Otherwise, it will not work. And second, we're going to mark our functions as being stitchable. Now, remember I told you SwiftUI is doing 95% of the work for us. All the device setup and rendering da -da -da, is being done for us. We're just doing the transformation part. So you imagine a big, long process of rendering metal stuff. We're just one tiny slice of that. And so SwiftUI has to be able to sort of stitch together its code and our code into one big function it can run to transform data somehow. Hence, marking our functions as being stitchable. It can be combined with other stuff to make a bigger piece of metal work. Now, you might wonder how we can find out the signatures. Turns out, if you look up a color effect modifier in SwiftUI, the first thing we're working with here, you'll get the color effect code. But if you scroll up, you'll find the exact function signature to use. So use open quickly, folks. It's Shift Command O in Xcode gets you right here. Just type color effect, zoom into this, boom. That's your function signature right there. So it's easy to get access to. And you can see already in there, it's marked stitchable. You must include that metal attribute here to say this can be combined with other stuff. And then we have the return value. See like functions, the return value comes before the function name. This returns a half four. Now you know already in Swift we have things like float and double, how much storage you want to give your floating point number. Half is another variant of that. But the four part is there because we have red, green, blue and alpha, RGBA, being used inside there. So this stores four floating point values for RGB and A. That's a return value. What color should we render this outgoing pixel as? You'll see the shader is currently called name. Obviously, you replace that with your own name when you want to write your own shader, but that's where it goes. The function name's right there. And it has values being passed in. We have a float two at an X and Y coordinate. That's the position we're working with for our pixel. And a half four of the current color, again, RGBA. Notice also, we have this args dot 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 part thing here. This can be a variadic function, taking one, two, three, whatever, extra values of your choosing automatically. We'll get onto that later on. And so, let's write our very first shader now. It's a pass through function here. As you can see, it returns a half four. Here's the new color to render this particular pixel. Our function is now called pass through rather than name. It's a much better name for a shader. You can see it takes a float two of the position, the X and Y coordinate we're working with right now for this particular pixel, plus a half four for its current color. And all we say is take that current color and send it back. Do nothing to it. And remember, our current Swift UI code is this. We're saying figure walk circle, nice large font, blue foreground style. We're going to add to that the color effect modifier. Apply a metal shader here to recolor this image. And you can see to get our pass through function being called, we just say shader library dot pass through. This is done through Swift's dynamic member lookup system. It sees pass through. At compile time, it does not know what that means, doesn't care what it means. At runtime, pass through says, okay, I've got a single pass through. I'm gonna look through all your metal shaders for one called pass through that's a color effect, and I'll call that right here. So it's a really nice way of linking uh, Swift code to metal code. And the result, brace yourself, <laughs> is this. After like 12, uh, 11 minutes of me talking, uh, we've got the same thing we had before, and I realize that's pretty dull. Uh, it's our very first shader. We're working towards something bigger. We're going to improve this. Just stick with me. Shade number two. Let's at least recolor what we have. 
This time, we have the same recolor thing going on, same uh, pause and uh, half or color, da, da, da. that hasn't changed. But look at the return value, that bit has changed. Now we're returning a half four of one zero zero color dot A. So again, half four, red, green, blue, alpha. We're saying one for red, full red, zero for green, no green, zero for blue, no blue, but color dot A. Use the current opacity, which means if you imagine we had said uh, full red, just, just regular full red, no opacity, whatever, just full red, you'd get a red rectangle back. Be useless, right? By using the current alpha value of the pixel we're reading, it means if the pixel is transparent, make it transparent in the output. If it's opaque, fully visible, make it red and opaque. If it's like 0 0.5, make it half visible, but still red. What this means is we're gonna get our input and output at least recolored now while respecting the transparency. So it's not a solid square anymore like that. It'd be, you can see through the bits that were see-through before. The result, of course, is still fairly dull, and that's okay, it's going somewhere, I promise. Let's do two more easy ones. We're gonna, the third one, we'll do an invert alpha shader. On this one, uh, it's again very similar. We have the half four on the pause. The return value this time, though, it's full red, uh, 100 zero, zero RGB. But then we have one minus color dot alpha for the returned alpha value. So imagine we're saying, okay, we've got a transparent pixel, alpha zero right now. We do one minus that, one minus zero, and now the alpha is one. So it was transparent, now it's fully opaque. Flip side, let's say it was uh, fully opaque, it was one, we do one minus one, we get fully transparent. So we're flipping the alpha around. Things that were opaque are now transparent, things that were transparent are now opaque, and everything in between varies some amount. And so we get an inverted alpha recoloring effect. One last easy one, a gradient fill. This time our return value is more complicated. We've got half all going back like always, a new color, but we're saying for the red, divide our X value by our Y value. So imagine we've got sort of a 50 by 50 size thing here. Uh, we've got zero to 50 for X and zero to 50 for Y. We're dividing, say, uh, one by one, one by two, one by three, one by four, one by five, all the way down, then two by one, two by two, three by three by one, three by two. It's going all the way down, different ranges of red across the board. And we also do the same for green, uh, for blue, sorry. Green zero, forget green, doesn't matter too much. But blue are saying, do the opposite range that differently to get a different range of colors here and send back the original alpha value to respect the original transparency for this picture. And now we get a gradient effect. Now remember, every single pixel of that gradient is being computed individually, dynamically by our shader function. And you're probably thinking, oh, this is stupid. I can do that in Swift UI in like two lines of code. Why do I use Metal for that? The most boring video I've sat through ever. Relax, it's about to get better. Let's look at accepting custom values into our shaders to get custom results. This is made possible because of that args dot 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 in the function signature. This thing is a variadic function. We can add more values here, custom values to get custom functionality. So we could, for example, make an animated gradient. Now this time, I'm gonna modify our Swift UI code just a little bit. I'm going to say there's some state for our view to track when it was created, the current time it was made. And then here's our current uh, UI code in the body. I'll take that and I'll wrap it in a timeline view of an animation schedule. So it's redrawing 120 times a second. Now inside that timeline view, before I draw the image, I'm going to ask Swift Swift to calculate how much time has elapsed. What's the distance from our start time to tl.date? tl.date is a date from our timeline view. What's the current date? So we'll say, okay, one second's elapsed, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2, 2, 3, 4, 10 seconds elapsed, whatever. It says how much time has gone by. Again, 120 times second on promotion displays. And now we don't want to say uh, shader library or pasture anymore. Instead, we're going to say, I want to apply a rainbow effect here, a function I haven't written yet, I'll do it shortly, but notice how I can just say dot float time. I can take that time constant from uh, Swift, 
in whatever Swift type is and say, actually, just make it a metal compatible float, please. That does the bridging work of transforming Swift types like floats and CG point and CG size da, 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 into metal compatible equivalents for us. It's really, really nice. Okay, let's now write the new uh, color effect shader here. So we have, again, returns a half four, takes a part, takes a color, that hasn't changed. But notice how this time it also accepts a float T, that time value being passed in from Swift. Now, it's a short name. Please call yours time or something sensible. I'm using obviously limited screen space in my video, so my variables got very, very short names to make it easy to read in your own code. Obviously, longer is better. So we accept the time value coming in. And now we're going to calculate the angle from the top left corner of this view image to the pixel we're trying to draw. But we add in the time value. So it changes the angle constantly over time. And so it'll animate. And now we're going to return various calls to sign using the angle, angle plus two, angle plus four, plus the original alpha value. Now it's not ideal here because uh, sine returns values in the range of one down to minus one. And of course, minus one for red, green, and blue doesn't make sense. So really it's gonna do one down to zero ultimately. Um, most values don't do anything, but it's still enough to create a nice animated effect. And the result is we get an animated gradient moving constantly between colors, shifting around. Simple, but again, we're moving forward. Because now you know how to add time using timeline view and distance between now and the current timeline time. We can do something more advanced. We can create a wave effect. Now this uh, is gonna let us adjust the position of our pixels to create a rippling effect on the screen. Now, previously we used color effect. Take this pixel in, take this fragment in, recolor it somehow. Same position, same data, just recolored slightly. We don't want that anymore. We're gonna actually move our um, pixels around on the screen. We're gonna move the position somehow, to transform them. So it's no longer a color effect. Instead, what we want is called a distortion effect. So we're gonna say, run our new wave shader through a distortion effect. Now, when you make a distortion effect, Swift wants to know a maximum sample offset. So you want to read further than the original pixel location, you want to read this pixel here, for example, move it around somehow, you gotta say how far you want to do it here. So SwiftUI makes the appropriate image data available to you. Now, if you're not sure, just start with zero and experiment from there, try and error a little bit, it's perfectly fine, particularly while you're learning. So we're gonna write our simple wave filter here. You can see we're receiving the position and a time and so forth. And we're doing the position Y plus equals, move it up or down slightly based on the sign of time plus position Y. Now without time being involved here, we're saying add from plus one to minus one, that's the signs range, some amount based on whatever the position Y is. So it'll move some up, some down, some up lots, some down lots, but still in the range of one to minus one. Factory in time means we're gonna move up and down constantly, creating a wave effect, like a ripple happening on the screen. It's gonna move constantly. Now remember, the range is one to minus one, so it's not gonna move very much. We're gonna create a very, very small, very, very small, slow, boring uh, wave effect. But it is, if you look very, very carefully, it is very gently rippling our pixels here. And so what we can do is, make this better, we can increase the strength. We're going to modify how much we adjust pos.y by multiplying the whole thing by five. Move them up or down by five to minus five, much more than one to minus one. And so the effect is still very, very slow, but at least it's you know, nice and jagged now. You can see it's doing something at least, even though it's very slow. We can then increase the frequency. We can multiply the time by five, so it runs five times faster. And now we can smooth out the whole effect. Rather than bring in pos.y as a whole, we can take in 1 20th of pos.y. And now we read out values on a much smoother level, creating a really good 
water effect like this one. But it's not perfect. I want you to look at this top part of the picture. This is completely flat. It's flattened out there. And that's happening because we're moving pixels up or down around our layer and we're moving some outside the bounds of our frame. And it's being clipped ultimately. It's going here, try and move beyond, and it's being cut off entirely. This is one of the golden rules of writing metal shaders with Swift UI. Your shader cannot expand your view's frame. If it goes beyond the frame, pff, tough luck, it's being clipped. And you can see this in action. Here is a waving flag without a distortion effect applied to it. You can see the top and bottom are being clipped constantly. To fix this, you want to add some extra space around your flag. Give it a solid color and render that to a new image by calling drawing group. And then apply a distortion effect. So you can see the bottom flag is not clipped. It looks much, much better. But we can take this effect further. We can create a relative wave effect. Because this flag right now isn't ideal, right? If you think about this flag attached to a virtual flagpole, um, and you look at the top left corner here, you can see it's actually not physically possible. It's escaping the flagpole on the left-hand side there because it's moving outside the range of the available space. It's not attached to the flagpole, really. That's not how flags work. Flags attached to the flagpole will move less when they're close to the flagpole and move more the further away they are. And we get the same thing in metal. We can say the further we are away from the edge, apply more and more movement. Now, bit of a problem with that. Here's our current function signature, a wave with some kind of time being put into this thing. We have no idea from that how big our actual flag is. If we're 20 pixels away, is that most of the flag? Is that hard gain of the flag? Is, is the flag 2,000 pixels or 1,000 or 500? We don't know. That's okay. We'll assume we do know for now. We're gonna go ahead and take our current wave code, right? Our current wave code is this thing here with pause and time coming in. And all we do is modify the Y by that particular equation from before. That has not changed. However, we're gonna add an extra value to this function. We're gonna say this thing is going to accept inside here a float to of the size of our image. Again, a short name, please call yours size and similar. I've got to make my fit on the screen, right? <laughs> and so call yours whatever you want, but I'm using S. That's the actual width and height of our total picture. And now, when we are trying to calculate how much to move something by, we want to know how far we are from the left edge. So we're gonna take uh, the position and divide it by our size. Think this one through. We have our flag picture here. If we have a X value of zero and a width of 100, we do our position zero divided by 100, distance would be zero. And so the left edge of our flag will have a uh, X position, or a distance, sorry, of, of zero. That's how far we are from the left edge here. Whereas if we are X 50 with 100, we're now gonna get 0 0.5. 50 divided by 100 is 0.5, right? And if we're X 100 with 100, we're now at distance one. So by doing this, by dividing our position, by our size, we get values in the range of zero to one. And this is a really helpful unit to have, often just called UV. You'll see UV a heck of a lot. It's some kind of clamp range of values to work with. Now, when we have that, our distance value, how far we are from the edge, we already have how much to transform our pos, uh, our Y position that whole sin T star five plus pos y, that's still there. But now we're gonna multiply in our distance x. Remember that value goes from zero to one. And before we're saying make the whole thing up and down, flag, 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 flag. Now we're saying multiply it by zero on the left-hand edge. 
because it's next to the flagpole, don't move very much. Whereas on the right hand edge, multiply by one, get the full strength of the flag waving. And we can even now increase the flag waving intensity to up to 10, for example, to get a really strong flag waving effect here, because we can. So multiply what we previously had by zero to one, to get different strengths of effect. But we still have a problem. Where does this float to of size come from? This is a problem because SwiftUI is notoriously secretive about giving us view sizes. We don't normally have access to these things. However, in iOS 17, that has now changed. It's fixed. We have a new modifier called visual effect. And it looks like this. I'm saying render the text hello world with a visual effect applied to it. And this thing runs a closure of ours passing in two values. The content is the current view you're working with. For us, that's text, hello world. It can be an image, whatever you want to. Kind of a bunch of modifiers already attached to it. We don't know, we don't care. It's that current view stack we're applied to right now. But we're also given a proxy. And this thing is the same geometry proxy we had with Geometry Reader, telling us the size for this content, its location on the screen, and more. It's really, really powerful. And best of all, it's not attached to Geometry Reader. It won't affect your layouts anymore. You just get the values of it as it is right now. And so we're going to use this. We'll attach a visual effect to our SwiftUI view hierarchy, to that image we had from earlier. And we'll say, okay, let's take our content, and we're going to apply to that our distortion effect to that content. Now, Inside here, again, we're calling shader library.wave, float elapsed, that has not changed. But notice how we can say, pass in the proxy size. How big this view actually is, is now available to us, which is exactly what our shader wants. And we can now just say dot float to convert this CG uh, size, uh, width and height into a XY float size for us in Metal's own data types. And the result is, uh, a more physically accurate sort of a flag effect going on where the left edge doesn't move and it moves increasing amounts towards the right edge when it's further away from the flag. And now you know how to read view size, we can look at an even more complicated shader. This one is a loop effect, a zooming effect I've had on iOS since I think day one. For this, you've got to learn the third way to load metal shaders into SwiftUI. I call them the holy trinity of metal. First you've seen already, that's a color effect. Got to return a new color, return a half four. We're given the position and the current color and of course extra arguments attached to that. You've seen distortion effects, we're moving pixels around. We've got to return the new position for the pixel, the float two, given the current position plus our custom values. But now we're gonna use a third one, the layer effect. And this thing, once we return the new color, that's fine, but it gives us access to the Swift UI layer directly. Give me the SwiftUI layer to work with. And so we can sample values, we can read values from there anywhere in the picture to say, okay, read this, read this, read this, to move things around as much as we want to. It's very, very powerful. And to do this, you've got to add a new include, hash include SwiftUI, uh, SwiftUI uh, underscore metal.h. Bring that include file in to get access to the SwiftUI layer. But now we can use uh, shaders like this one. And you can see I'm now bringing in the layer, again called L to fit on the screen nicely. That's our layer we're working with. That's the actual image or padding or who knows what we have, background colors, the thing we're actually trying to transform somehow here. That's our layer. We have our position, we have our size as well, that's pause and S. I'm also accepting a float to for touch. Where is the user currently touching the screen? Now, inside here, I'm gonna break it down to multiple screens, make it easy to understand. The first thing we make is a constant called max distance. This is how, how far our zoom should work. The loop, when you press it in Swift UI, uh, sorry, Swift, well, iOS generally, sorry, um, you press it and it zooms some area around your finger. It doesn't zoom the whole screen, that'd be a bit odd. Zooms just some circle around your finger, that's our max distance value here. How much around our finger we want to zoom. Then we'll calculate our UV again. So we have a range of zero to one, that's our position divided by our size like before. We're going to calculate the center value as UV coordinates. So we've got our touch position divided by size. It'll say we're touching at 0 0.25, 0 0.75. 
a quarter of the way across and a quarter, three quarters of the way down, for example. And now we're going to ask, what is the difference between uh, the user's, uh, so the pixel's position, the UV, and the fingers uh, of the, the user? So imagine I'm drawing a pixel here, fingers here, that's the delta value. How far this pixel is away from their finger on the screen. And finally, we're going to pre-calculate the aspect ratio. So we can uh, calculate distances correctly in images that aren't perfectly square. And now we're going to use a very, very simple formula you might have seen before at, in our high school. Uh, this one here, uh, delta x times delta x plus delta y times delta y. We divide by aspect ratio again. We don't need to keep that thing happily in non-square environments. But what you're seeing here is part of Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, if you think back to school, to see how far I've moved, you say, how far across, how far down have I moved? And you use that to calculate the hypotenuse. Uh, this is a Pythagorean theorem or Pythagoras' theorem, which school you went to uh, here. We're saying how far is the distance from the user's touch position to this pixel? That's what we're asking here. We aren't doing a square root. You know, Pythagoras' theorem, you've got to do a square root here to get the actual distance here. We don't care about that. We can skip that. Um, we can basically bypass it to be faster, avoid that work entirely. And once we have that distance, we now know how far this touches from our actual pixel we're trying to draw right now. Now, by default, we're going to use a 100% zoom, which means we'll show the regular number of pixels in this screen space, in our little loop area here. But if the current distance in this pixel from the touch is less than our maximum distance, how much you want to zoom in that circle space, then we halve our total zoom. What we're saying here is we want to show half as many pixels in that space. Imagine this loop circle here. If you're drawing 100%, it'd be the regular one-to-one -one pixel mapping. We've halved it. Show half as many pixels in there. Stretch them up to fill the larger space. And that stretching is our zoom effect here. So now we know how much to zoom by. We can now figure out what pixels should be read to draw inside that zoom. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our delta, how far our original uh, pixel offset was from the, from the uh, finger here. Multiply in our total zoom and then put it back into the center again. Remember, the delta just tracks how far away it is from their finger on the screen. We're going to recenter that now by adding center here. And finally, that's the pixel we should be reading. This thing will be okay, you work around and read 0 0.25, 0 0.25, because it's in UV space. We don't want that. We want actual pixel coordinates. Please read pixel 375x and 45y. And so we're going to multiply new position, that new pause by our original image size, get back to image pixel space, and then call sample on our SwiftUI layer. Read the color at that coordinate and send that back. That's our shader. I know it's quite a lot, but I hope you like it. Now we can write some SwiftUI code again. Back out of UI vote code will make some storage to store the user's current touch position, set to zero by default. And then we have our uh, visual effect happening here. We're using a loop with the offset being passed in as a float two, along with our size. But we're also going to attach a gesture here to track the user's finger as they move around on the screen. As they move, you can see the unchanged sets that touch state to be the current location of their finger on the screen. And the result is, here's uh, Singapore Airport. As they move their finger around on the screen, it zooms in. So it's stretching fewer pixels up to fill the larger space. That's what it's doing. That's neat. But we can do better with only one small change. Here's our current zoom effect here. Remember, a lower total zoom means fewer pixels being stretched up to fill that loop zoom area. So the lower total zoom is, the fewer pixels we're reading, the more we're going to stretch them up higher and higher, getting bigger and bigger magnification effect. So what we're going to say is, after we've figured out, yes, this is less than maximum distance, yes, there's a pixel which we're changing right now, we half total zoom, zoom it up 
It's twice as big. But then we're going to add back in some amount, total zoom. We'll unzoom based on how far this pixel is away from the user's touch. What this means is when distance is zero, it's right under their finger, we have maximum zoom, 0.5 zoom, okay? Doubling the pixel size. But as that's further away, but still within the circle of the loop, as it's further away, distance is bigger. And so we add back into that more and more amounts, undoing the zoom. And so now we get a much nicer effect. We get effectively like a, 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 a glass ball moving around the screen, warping the effect as an orb moves around with different levels of zoom happening on here. Again, lightning fast, thanks to all those shader units. And it's a lovely effect, but we're now only two parts through. We're on to part three now. You're doing well so far. Stick with me. <laughs> We're now gonna look at transitions, you know, how we show and hide views on the screen. Now for a long time, SwiftUI of course loves transitions. We can simply create a custom view modifier, wrap this thing in an any transition extension to be easier to use, and then we're done. It's worked brilliantly for a very long time. And you can create some wonderful transitions in pure SwiftUI code. Here's one, for example, we could say, make a blur transition with a progress value going between zero and one. And what we'll say is, we're gonna blur this amount uh, by 10 times the progress. So start not blurred and end up being 10 points of blur. And for opacity, we'll start at one minus progress, which means when it's progress is zero, it's just starting out, opacity is one. When it's finishing, opacity is zero. So we fade out over time. So it blurs and fades. You then wrap that thing in a custom any transition extension to be easier to use. Again, you can see progress one down to progress zero. And that's all it takes. Pure Swift UI code. We get a very nice blurring, fading transition out of the box. It's great. We could say also, let's do a, a zooming transition. Well, this time we've got a scale effect of one plus progress. So when progress is zero, scale effect 100% unchanged. When progress is one, we're zoomed up to twice the size. So it's gonna zoom up and fade out. The clipping part's important, by the way, so it doesn't escape its drawing rect on the screen. And now you get this kind of transition. It just looks great. And this is, again, pure Swift UI code. But brilliantly, of course, why it's in the talk, Metal can do this too. And I'm not just trying to squeeze this in here to make your life painful here. There's a brilliant Hard Times headline, love, which is uh, man convinced coffee tastes better after making it in a much more inconvenient way. Um, I'm not just trying to squeeze in metal because it's fun and makes it taste better. Um, we can create some really great effects with this. For example, let's again start fairly simple. Well, of course, we're working our way up slowly here. We're on shade number eight now. We'll make a shape transition. So we're gonna make a shape transition where we have a whole flurry of circles zooming up and making our picture fade out, basically. So we'll say we have this circles transition. Now you can see we have the float to position, half full color, float to size, just like before. But now we're saying as well, give me the amount value, where zero is the start of our transition, nothing's changed yet, and one is the end of our transition. It's fully finished, fading out the whole thing. Now inside here, I'm gonna say we've got a strength of 20, a circle size of 20, and this matters. So we'll try and figure out for this pixel, how far is it from its nearest circle? When we compare the circle it's working with, how far is it from the center of that circle? So imagine we have a, a big picture, this big blue picture here, zoomed in obviously very much. That yellow dot is the pixel we're trying to work with right now. Now we're gonna fill this whole screen with circles. And that's what the effect's doing. It'll zoom out these circles to make it fade away and cut them out nicely. That pixel needs to know where it is relative to its nearest circle. So one on the left, the one on the right don't matter. We count the one in the middle. That's its nearest circle right now. We want to know how far is that from its center. Because circles are gonna start small and zoom up, zoom up, zoom up. And so pixels in the middle will change immediately. Pixels on the outside of the circle will change at the very, very end. And so 
Again, we're gonna use Pythagoras' theorem here. What's the distance between me and the circle center? Now, I'll show you how this is done. It's actually fairly straightforward. What we're gonna do is, back in our code again, we have our position, pause, and we have the strength value, 20. How big are our circles we're working with? And so we're gonna take our position and divide it by the strength. So imagine position is something like 205194. Our strength's 20. We're gonna divide 205194 by 20. And it'll say, okay, you are 10.25 circles across and 9.7 circles down. Now, of that information, we don't actually care about a 10, oh, hello dogs, the 10 or the nine part. We don't care how many circles we are across, we don't care uh, how many circles we are down, we just care how much relative we are to the current circle. You hungry dogs, aren't you? How we are relative to this nearest circle. And metal's got a function just for that on the screen. It has a function called fract. And fract has a job of discarding the fractional values of numbers. So you can see we have <laughs> 10.25 and we have 9.7. And frat has a job of saying, actually, just discard the 10 and the 9 parts. So I can say, okay, frat 10.25, 9.7. And that's going to yield 0 0.25, 0 0.7. Again, we don't care we're 10 circles across and 9 circles down. We just care we're 0.25 of the way through the current circle. We're a quarter of the current circle. And 0 0.7, 7 tenths of the way down to the current circle. That's the bit we care about. So, once we have that information, we'll store that neatly in a new value here called f. Two tweets is enough, dogs, clear off. Uh, here, I'm gonna say, okay, we have that information, 0 0.25, 0 0.7. How far are we from a center of the circle? 0 0.5 is the center of our circle. How far are we from that? So again, we are a quarter of the way through, 0.7 of the way down through our circle. And the center of the circle will be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. The nearest circle, right smack in the middle here. What we're going to say is, again, Pythagoras' theorem. What's the distance to these two things here? That's what a distance call does. How far are we from the center of the circle? Once we have that, once we know how far we are from the center of our nearest circle, that's when we can say which color to draw. If our distance is less than our amount, again, 0 to 1, send back the current color. Otherwise, send back uh, uh, zero. So what we're saying here is pixels closest to the center, you know, distance is zero, for example, will send back the color sooner, right? Because they're less than the amount. As the amount increases, increases, increases up to one, basically all distance are less than that effectively because it's not really zero to one because it's a square root, um, but it's close enough, right? So we're saying the change the closest pixels different, different from the further away pixels. That's what's happening here. So the amount matters. Between zero and one affects how much of the uh, source color or zero, transparent basically, is being sent back. And the result is this kind of transition here. The circles fade up smoothly on the screen. That's our, uh, our strength size there, by the way, like that but we can do better because we know where we are on the screen. What we can say is in our code here, is our current code, if our distance is less than the amount, so distance zero, amount zero, fine, whatever. But when we're further away, distance amount is zero, then send back transparent. And as it grows and grows and grows, it sends back more of the other picture. We can make this better. Rana's just checking distance alone. We can add to this a little bit more. We can say, take our distance from the center of the circle, but factor in our UVX and our UVY. Again, zero to one on X and Y. And so what this means is, we're gonna taking halfway off from the circle, but it means the ones at the very beginning, UVX and UVY will be zero for the ones at the top left corner. So over here for you, reverse the thing, right? <laughs> over here, top corner, will change immediately. Whereas ones at UVX, UVY, when that's one and one, the bottom right corner, they'll change much, much later. So we have D, distance, which is approximately between zero and one, not exactly because it's a distance. 
Uh, we have x and y, which is from 0 to 1. So potentially we have 0 to 3 being used here. Our amount value is 0 to 1 concurrently. So we're going to multiply that by 3 to get 0 to 3. And now we get this effect here. We get a kind of flowing circular wave transition all the way through. Because the ones at the very end transition later than the ones at the very start. They've got higher UVX and UVY than the ones at the very start. And that's neat. We can transform this even more. Again, very, very little work here. Again, here's our current code. We're using distance, which is Pythagoras' theorem. The whole x squared plus y squared is z squared, right? Uh, that's fine. Rather than doing that, I'm going to calculate distance using what's called Manhattan distance, sometimes called taxi cab distance. It looks like this. We're getting the absolute distance between our uh, current position, 0.7 for example, and 0.5. So we're 0.2 away. And adding that to the absolute distance for our y position as well. So we're getting x plus y in absolute terms. So we get negative numbers, always positive numbers here. It's a one line change, but the effect is also beautiful. Now we get a sort of diamond transition fading across the screen. And I'll show you how this thing works here, if you aren't familiar with Manhattan distance. Again, here's our current code. And all the work here is taking place in this abs fx, abs fy line here. Imagine you are in New York, in Manhattan, or any, any city where it's grid based. And you're stuck in the middle of the grid here, and you want to move two blocks in one direction. We would say to move forward, you go straight forward two blocks. North two blocks. You're there now, okay? If you were to walk east two blocks, or south two blocks, or west two blocks, that's where you end up each time. That's your distance. Now, if you want to walk diagonally, you can't. There's no way you can walk straight through that blue, uh, you know, skyscraper next to you here. You've got to walk forward one block and then right one block. So you've walked two blocks of distance. And in Pythagoras' terms, the hypotenuse is not two to two away, right? Because you've walked forward one, walked right one. One squared plus one squared is like the square root of two, 1.4, whatever it is. But in uh, the terms of Manhattan distance, that is two blocks away. Forward one, right one, is the same distance as going forward twice. Or going south, then east, or south, then west, or uh, north, then west, whatever. They're all two blocks distance. And now you can see very, very clearly where that diamond shape comes from. That's exactly what our shade is doing behind the scenes here. Let's go ahead and do one more transition, a much more advanced transition called a cross warp. This is going to stretch our pixels out from the center while also making them fade out. It's a lovely, lovely effect. It looks like this. We've got a cross warp function here. Read our position, read our layer, read our size, read the amount again between zero and one here. We want to get the UV straight away. Where are we between zero and one relative to the overall size of our thing? Now, we're going to use a very, very simple little formula here uh, to calculate uh, how much to transform our input by, how much stretch to apply. Now, imagine our picture being drawn or being uh, transitioned like this from left to right. When we have that, the little uh, formula we're going to use is the amount value times 2 plus UVX minus 1. Now, I'm going to give you some examples here. So you can reason this through slightly more. When amount is zero, the transition has not begun yet, right? The new transition, nothing should have happened yet. We take amount times two, zero times two, still zero. The left edge of our image has a UVX of zero. That's what UV does, zero to one. So UVX is zero. So we have amount times two, zero, plus zero, still zero, minus one. And so the left edge of our code here will have a resulting value of minus one. That's what will happen here with our little uh, um, formula. When we're looking at the right edge of our thing, 
that has amount times two, still zero. UVX is now one. So we have one minus one, the right edge will be zero. So saying when the transition has not even begun yet, that's fine. It's okay. Minus one on one side, zero on the other side, neither are transformed in this layout. That's fine. If we go forward to be halfway through the transition, now we have amount times two. So 0 0.5 times two is one. The left-hand edge again has UVX of zero. So we have one plus zero minus one. And so the left edge of our view has not been transformed at all. So halfway through our transition, the left edge has not been touched. The right edge, UVX one, again, amount times two makes one, plus one makes two, minus one makes one. So the right edge of our view will have a finished value of one. It has finished its transformation fully. Now let's go to the end. We have uh, amount of one. Again, amount times two, one times two makes two. The left edge has a UVX of zero. So we have two plus zero minus one. That means the left edge is now on one. It has finished its transition fully. And the right edge has UVX of one. That'll have an amount of uh, resulting value, sorry, of, of two. And so those are the range of values we're gonna get out of this little formula here. We're saying we can work between the values of minus one, zero, one, and two. Those are the possible values our little uh, formula can produce. The problem is we only actually care about values in the range of zero to one. We don't care about minus one, we don't care about two, that doesn't cause problems. What we really want is zero to one. And here we can use a very, very helpful metal function called smooth step. And smooth step does two things. The first thing it does is it clamps values to the range of our choosing. So we're saying, in our case, we want zero and one. If it's less than zero, minus one, minus two, minus a million, make it zero. If it's greater than one, two, three, a billion, whatever, make it one. And so smooth step will transform our values so everything lower than zero is just zero. Everything greater than one is just one. So now our input range is just zero or one, which is nice, it clamps for us. But as the name suggests, it also smooths out values. It creates values that look like this. We call it an ease in, ease out curve. Kind of starts slow, picks up speed, then slows down towards the end automatically. So we're gonna put our little formula through smooth step in the range of zero to one to figure out what to do with our data. And so we get this. Our transformation amount, is again, we're using UVX here, we're moving across the screen, so I left to right for you, it's like this for you uh, here. Uh, so it's gonna move across, you're gonna X value, figure out that position, again, a range of zero to one through smooth step. That's what it's doing here. Once we have that, now it's time to figure out which pixel we want to draw. Now, if we draw the original pixel, it'll be pretty dull. What we want to do is make it stretch out from the middle. So we want to say is get the middle pixel, 0.5, so it's on the middle of the whole image, and use our pixel or the middle pixel by some blending factor. So when X is zero, use our original pixel. When X is one, use that middle pixel. For all other values, use intermediate pixels in between. And so it's gonna stretch it out. It'll use increasingly more towards the middle, pulling it further and further apart as it progresses. That's done with the mix function. So we're saying mix our value, the UV, with the center value by some amount of X. When X is zero, it's fully UV. X is one, it's fully 0 0.5, fully the center. All the values are some intermediate value between. So it's gonna stretch it outwards. And now we can sample that pixel. Remember that's in UV space, UV space still. We're gonna multiply it back by image size, get image pixel space, so we can call sample correctly on it. But we'll do one extra thing here. When we sample the value back out, L.sample, I'll mix that again. We'll say, okay, get the pixel in the picture, blend that with zero, the transparent color, by the value of X. So we're stretching it out and fading it out over time as a thing progresses. And that creates a left to right crosswalk. 
if we make the opposite a right to left cross warp and mix the two together, so one is left to right, one's right to left, we get this effect right here. Boom. It's a really nice sort of stretching, warping effect happening on the screen. So that's transitions in metal. We're not quite done yet. I want to show you how we can take metal and use it everywhere to generate complete graphics from scratch in metal. This is our most complex shader yet, and I'll do it step by step to show you how just literally noodling around, trying things out can help you explore metal in a fun way. Try things out, see where it takes you. You can make something really beautiful. We're gonna create an effect I call a sign bow. Uh, <laughs> first things first, let's look at our transformation code, okay? We have this still a timeline view with a distance being for time. We have a color effect now. We're just rendering all for our hand. There's no distortion, uh, no layer effect. We just wanna have a, a, a color effect and raw all the pixels by hand, calling our sign bow. But notice how it's all being run on a simple rectangle now. Basically, give me a big chunk of screen space to draw into is all we're saying. Don't care about the image anymore. It's being overwritten with a rectangle. And now we'll make our first pass at our sign bow shader. Again, position coming in, current color coming in, current size coming in, current time coming in, and we're getting our UV. But notice how I'm modifying it here. We're, we're saying I want this UV value to be in the range of minus one to plus one, not one to zero anymore, minus one to plus one here. It's slightly different, it works better in the effect. Okay, now we're gonna calculate a waveform. And waves are very easy to do thanks to sine. Sine creates waves for you automatically. We can say, get our X position, adding in the time, it's gonna fluctuate up and down and put it through sine. And remember, sine creates values in the range of one to minus one. So this would make the world's tiniest, most boring sine wave, which is dull, if we, multiply the wave by itself, we're squaring the wave, it will make the uh, frequency, how often the wave comes up and down, twice as much. So it might be this to start with, and now it's like twice as much, right? But I'm then multiplying that by 50, get a really strong wave effect. The peaks and the valleys are much, much bigger. And now we're gonna calculate the brightness for the current pixel. How bright should this be on the screen? So we're gonna say that our brightness, our luminescence here is one over 100, 1% brightness by default. Now one over the value means this is a reciprocal, which means larger numbers in that 100 side, the right side, which is for you, I guess this side for you, um, mean the brightness gets lower and lower and lower. So we're taking a hundredth by default, not a lot. But then we're gonna multiply in our Y position. And so we're getting that value here, again, the range of minus one to one, so it's gonna fluctuate here, multiplied by 100. So we're gonna get the right-hand range of being minus 100 to plus 100. But then we're gonna factor in that sine wave to bring the brightness back up again based on where it is in the wave. And we'll send back all that as a single half four. Luma, luma, luma one. So red, green, and blue are all the same brightness value with full opacity. What this means is if it's really close to the waveform, it'll be brightly colored. Otherwise, it'll get darker and darker down to black. But it'll also be grayscale because it's obviously RGB and B all the same value. So we get this output here. Now, if you look closely, you might see there's a glow effect below the line because the closer you are to the line, the brighter it is till it hits the line when it's full on white and the glow effect only appears at the bottom, not at the top, and the whole line's a bit low in the screen, we can fix both of those things. First things first, uh, here's how we calculate the UV right now, uh, which makes sense, a range of uh, one to minus one. Um, if we just basically nudge it down <laughs> by 0.15, then it'll be centered correctly. A tiny change, but it looks better on the screen. We can also make the glow under the line, that sine wave, appear both above and below. Now right now we have this code here to get our brightness. And our, our UVY can be one 
to minus one. And so we've got a whole bunch of brightnesses right now, like 0 0.5, 0 0.75, brightness one, brightness zero, but also brightness not, uh, minus 0 0.5, minus one, minus whatever, which is meaningless. And so really we want to say when you have like a brightness of minus 0 0.1, you're very close to the line on the wrong side, make it brightness 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1. This is called the absolute value. So we can say, put that whole thing through the abs call to basically remove the sign, make it all positive. And so with that small change, firstly, our line is centered. But secondly, the glow appears on both sides of the line correctly now, which is much, much nicer. Next, let's look at our color. Right now, sending back that luminescence value, luma, luma, luma for red, green, and blue, which makes grayscale colors. Instead of doing that, we can create rainbow colors. We can say, make a new half three, three colors, R, G, and B, no alpha here. For red, we'll use sine of 0 0.3 plus time. The green and blue will be fixed of 0 0.3 plus two, 0 0.3 plus four. We'll return to this shortly, don't worry. So red will fluctuate here over time. Now again, sine generates values in the range of one to minus one. And so it's gonna make red, green, and blue values in the range of one to minus one. Everything below zero is pointless. It's like black, still black, more black, just nothing, basically. No red is irrelevant, right? And so what we want to do really is normalize this into the range of one to zero. And so we'll take all those sign values and multiply them by a half and add a half. So we're saying first halve the value. So it was one to minus one. Now it's going to be uh, my, uh, plus 0 0.5 to minus 0 0.5. That's our new range, we're halving it. We then add a half to get one to zero, which is the range we actually want. Better for colors. All the colors have more meaning now because you know negative numbers don't actually make sense. So that's our new way of calculating values. And now rather than sending back luma, 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 we instead still use that brightness value, how far you are away from the line, but bring in the rainbow half three as well. So multiply that RGB value by how far they are from the line, and now we're gonna get this effect. And remember, red's gonna fluctuate with time. Green and blue currently do not, and that's okay. But the result is our line gently changes color from green, and there's no red, up to uh, red, a yellow kind of color, and there's more red. So, let's go further. The human eye is very sensitive to the color green. And so right now, the green color isn't fluctuating. It's staying at 2.3 halved, whatever, with sine. It's, it's fixed, effectively, which is dull. We can add another sine wave to this. We can say, actually, I want you as green to fluctuate on your own sine time, your own wave moving independently from the red moving as well. And we're gonna say in here, take the sine of our time, a third of that times two. These are just numbers through trial and error, effectively, to try and get nice speed and nice fluctuation of it. So we're saying fluctuate even more on your own time. And now what you get is the green comes and goes. And again, the human eye is very sensitive to green. And so we have full green, you get a nice, thick, chunky, sort of fat line going on. But as the green goes away, and it's separate to the red going away, a different speed they're going, different wave happening here, the line will look thinner, or thicker depending on what's happening. So it's constantly like right now, it's hardly any green, it's a really skinny thin line, you see. Anyway, let's go further. Here's currently how we calculate our pixel color. Get the brightness, get the rainbow color, and set about a new color. I've hidden some parts behind dot dot dot. They aren't changing here, they're not important here. What we're gonna say is rather than calculate the color from the rainbow at the last line there, I'm instead gonna start off with a wave color of half three zero, which means really uh, so red zero, green zero, blue zero, RGB to zero, zero, zero. Okay, that's our wave color. And then I'm going to send back that wave color with an alpha of one, which sounds dull, but notice how I'm adding wave color, uh, adding, to, to adding to wave color, the rainbow times luma. So it starts out as black and I add in the rainbow and luma. So it creates the same thing. We were sending back rainbow times luma. We now start with black, add that rainbow times luma, making rainbow times luma, and send that back. The same result. So why bother? And that is, now we have this effect. What we can say is, 
Let's loop it. Count from zero up to excluding 10, adding the wave color again and again and again, make it brighter and brighter and brighter. And now we're generating 10 lines of brightness. So our pixel takes on multiple pieces of color, brighter and brighter and brighter, depending on how far away it is. And here's the result. We get much more exaggerated line effects going on as we add colors together again and again and again. So you can really see how much they fluctuate here because the fainter pixels are now much, much brighter because we add to them 10 times over. But we're not gonna stop there. We're just getting started really. Here's our current loop code. Count from zero to 10, get our brightness and so forth. That's fine. Inside the loop, I'm gonna nudge down the Y by 0.05. Just nudge it down a tiny amount each time. Now remember, in shaders, we're not, not actually drawing lines to the screen. We're just trying to calculate how far away we are from the nearest line to get its brightness. Moving that down a little bit each time. And we have 10 of these things. So what it creates is the effect of having 10 separate color changing lines almost blending together as they get brighter and brighter and separating when they're darker because the, the, the whole brightness comes down here. It looks fantastic, but we're still not done. Let's look at the way we calculate our colors. This is what it is right now. We have uh, the red, green, and blue. Again, there's dot, dot, dot. There's more work happening there. Forget that, you get the idea. Um, the, there's still just the same red, green, and blue value every single time. What we can say is, as well as those current values, let's bring in our loop variable. Let's bring in i times that. So we zero times it, one times it, two times, three times it, all the way up to including nine times at the very end. And now it means every one of those different lines will add different kinds of color to the pixel we're calculating. And you get this kind of effect. We're really getting somewhere now, I think. It looks fantastic but we're gonna make one last change here. They are all following the same sine wave right now, and that matters, we're gonna keep that. But here's the start of our loop. We're gonna get the base brightness here, offset each line by uh, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, yeah, that's correct, sorry. <laughs> we're gonna to add to this a second wave, okay? A second Y value. And this brings in Again, a sign of our times that's changing constantly, brings in the loop variable as well, a small amount of it. So they're doing different things based on where they are in those 10 things. So we're changing them over time. And this means every one of our values have a different Y value. So we're gonna multiply 0 0.05 times that. So it's gonna modify the wave position. So they all have the same general wave, but inside that's a secondary wave adding more complex movement. And the result is this. The waves almost look like they're alive as they're changing color, rippling, twisting, turning, brightness, overlapping. There's all sorts going on right here. And honestly, if you've ever played the game Mario Kart, this probably gives you a bit of an eye twitch because it looks just like the rainbow road course in Mario Kart, which is where everyone dies, of course. And astonishingly, this whole thing takes just 15 lines of metal shading language, including the function signature, including the closing braces, 15 lines of code. This stuff is concise. Okay, I've let you enough, where next? Firstly, I promised you, I told you, if you thought this'll hurt your brain, at this point thinking, wow, it's an hour and 10 minutes of Paul talking code at me. Yeah, there's a lot of work here. But if you still want more, first, please go to thebookofshaders.com. The folks who wrote this have taught countless tens of thousands of people how to write great shaders, explaining exactly what they all do bit by bit by bit. Second, if you want inspiration, go to shadertoy.com. The folks there make the most outrageously complicated, beautiful shaders, but it'll blow your mind what you can do with these things. It's really remarkable. I get tons of inspiration from there. I also get inspiration, including from this talk, 
from gltransitions.com, all open source, all MIT licensed transitions to work with. It's OpenGL shading language, so GLSL, um, but they're there to learn from, they're to be inspired by and reuse your own code. So have a check out there and see what you think. You can also go to Apple's official documentation, develop at apple.com slash metal, because I've just covered these fragment shaders here, and only part of those, quite frankly. There's also things like metal performance shaders doing a whole bunch of extra work behind the scenes. It's a really, really powerful framework, and we've just scratched the scratch of the scratch of the surface here in this video. And I have my own series teaching metal shaders with Swift UI in Hacking with Swift Plus. That's at hackingwithswift.com slash plus. You can go and check that out. Now, one last thing. Almost certainly you're thinking, this has been really good. Where can I get the code? And I'm really pleased to tell you I have just open sourced a library I'm calling Inferno at github.com slash two straws slash Inferno. It's all the code from this talk, plus a whole bunch of extra shaders to noodle around with, all meticulously documented and explained, all open source for you to use in your own projects. Please check it out. If you enjoyed this video, Leave a like, please subscribe and make many more videos like this one, teaching Swift, Swift UI, and so much more. And if you can, please leave a comment below. Are you inspired to try writing metal shaders? Let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Take care, folks.